Welcome to lecture 23 of electromagnetic field and waves. So uh, last time we looked at uh, two things primarily. The first thing we looked at was uh, reflections from a conducting interface. And the second thing that we looked at was that we explored the skin depth in quite a lot of detail. Uh, and we saw its uh, frequency dependence and its dependence on the conductivity de uh, on the conductivity of the uh, uh, of the conductor. Uh, today, so so in, in essence, uh, so we've basically. Uh, done most of the uh, fields related component of the course. So now you have a good grasp of the machinery of Maxwell equations. Um, we've seen how, uh, how, you, how you come up with a wave equation, we've seen how you solve the wave equation and we basically looked at plane wave solutions in dielectrics, you've looked at plane wave solutions in conductors um, and if you extrapolate uh, basically uh, this tells you what happens to electromagnetic waves in a very very uh, uh, diverse set of scenarios. Um, what we want to do starting from today, and this will actually form a significant part of the uh, of the remaining part of our course, uh, we basically want to start transmission lines. Um, and uh, this will be a rather subtle introduction and what I'll try to do is that I'll try to link everything we've done before to uh, uh, to our study of transmission lines but the first question that uh, is that what is a transmission line so let's let me try to give you some sort of something that looks like a definition well a transmission line is basically something that is uh, used to transmit electrical energy uh, and signals from a source to a receiver. So, uh, examples of transmission lines. Let's say uh, I'll just list uh, list a few. For example, the uh, Ethernet cable. between uh, a router in your home and the uh, modem um, of your PC. That cable is a transmission line. Another obvious example are uh, electrical wires uh, between let's say a power station And um, uh, and your local grid station. So, for if you if you're driving along a highway, um, let's say the M2 highway in Pakistan, uh, going from Lahore to Islamabad, then um, the uh, big transmission lines you often uh, like the big cables you see going next to you are usually connected to some either main grid station to a smaller grid station or the main uh, electricity generation plant somewhere and a main grid station somewhere so those are classic examples of transmission lines um, <clears throat> and, and and try to link this to what we discussed about the skin effect last time uh, just to connect some of the mental dots so now the question is that Why are we suddenly interested in transmission lines? I mean, uh, I mean, you have, you already have circuit theory. Right, you already have circuit theory to solve uh, uh, to solve for the current and voltage uh, in different areas uh, we already uh, 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 and you know we've done um, like we have looked at 
electric and magnetic fields uh in uh, in interfaces or rather just say at interfaces and in different mediums but you see um transmission lines are about um so transmission lines are about the transport of energy and information and um basically they start mattering when the wavelength and phase of a wave starts to matter for example consider the circuit consider the following circuit let's say um uh let's say that uh this is let's say this is a printed circuit board and um <clears throat> imagine that this is some uh voltage source um let's say this is ground uh this is some module a and this is some module b okay um uh, now uh let's say v sub a is the voltage at module a and v sub b is the voltage at module b now if a and b now now keep this keep this in your mind so now if site a and b are so far apart or the frequency of the voltage signal is so fast that the phase at a and the phase at b are very different from another then transmission line theory is important because then we can't assume that the voltage is identical uh, in all uh, points uh, on the circuit or then we can uh, and for the same matter for example if you have a hydroelectricity plant in one city and if you have a, have a grid station in another city then you have so so many different wave uh, and so so many different wavelengths between uh, between those two points uh, and so you can't obviously assume that the phase is the same right and so then we need uh, transmission line theory to look at the propagation um, uh in uh, uh along these conductors uh and, and and try to solve for uh how much how, uh, what the current is in uh, in at different points what the voltage is at different points and how do we uh, and how do we translate that basically now um <clears throat> in this course we might not have enough time to explore wave guides in a lot of detail if we were doing wave guides then we would have paid a lot of attention to the uh to, to the to the electric and magnetic fields themselves instead what we will do is that we will explore transmission lines from the perspective of voltages and currents um and so since we're looking at voltages and currents then especially for the uh for the, for the physics majors who are taking this course i just want to spend the next 5 minutes um uh, 
revising some of the basic uh, circuit elements. I mean, the double images might find the next five minutes slightly boring, and I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to discuss the resistors, inductors, and capacitors. So just to just to reiterate, so a linear resistor, right? So let's just talk about basic circuit elements because you want to look at currents and voltages and transmission lines. So a linear resistor, uh, you basically denote it by the following symbol. Right, it has some resistance, capital I, and it obeys Ohm's law, which is V is equal to I I. So V is the voltage drop across the resistor. I is the current flowing through the resistor. Um, and um, if you let's say have a circuit of the sort that you have some voltage source V, and this is let's say connected to a switch. S and there's only one element in this circuit and that is this resistor R then uh, this obeys uh, V equals I R and uh, since R is usually just a real number uh, there's no phase inside of it so um, V and I are in phase in a resistor only circuit okay now i think we all understand resistors quite well uh, let's just talk about inductors for a couple of minutes so inductors now in circuit theory we denote inductors by the following symbol uh, the symbol for inductance is capital L and if you recall what we did uh, when we when we first in, uh, encountered inductors um, at the when we were doing magnetostatics so inductance is basically it's nothing more but an effect due to the self inductance of an object or arrangement so um, the idea basically is that um, it so phi 1 is equal to L times I 1 so the inductance this the, the, the uh, this factor this tells you how the current uh, flowing through an object or arrangement affects the flux, the magnetic flux uh, through that object. So L tells you how current in an object affects its magnetic flux. right uh, and as an extension of Faraday's law we saw that the voltage drop the voltage drop V across an inductor is L di by dt right uh, this is the voltage drop across an inductor um, so um, for example Uh, consider the voltage let, let's say we, we consider uh, a voltage V which is equal to some V naught e to the i omega t right now that of course this is a complex uh, voltage the real voltage would just be the real part of this so that will be a cosine um, cosine omega t right this is very this is, this is possible um, so let's say you have an, an, an inductor only circuit
so that'll be something like uh, just have some voltage source it's a time varying source because v is v not e by i to omega t once again we have our switch and this time we have an inductor l right so this is the voltage um, being applied the switch is closed what's the current well i would become equal to so capital i becomes equal to v naught over iota omega l e to the power iota omega t right so uh, that becomes equal to using euler's uh, identity v naught over omega l e to the power iota omega t e to the e to the power minus i pi by 2 right so there's a e to the minus i pi by 2 factor of phase between the current and the voltage so unlike a resistor so unlike a resistor v and i are 90 degrees out of phase in an inductor only circuit right um and and since since you have e to the minus i pi by 2 in the uh, 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 in the current so in, a, in in an inductor only circuit current lags voltage right and uh, this then brings us this is essentially pretty much all you need to understand and know about an inductor right um, everything has an inductance and the reason that everything has an inductance is that for most things when you pass the current through them the flux through through that arrangement changes and the inductor just tells you how how the flux changes when the current changes essentially now let's move on to the uh, the last component that i want to discuss and like i said for most of you this is just uh, revision but uh, i think it's important for us to all to be just on the same page so bear with me please so uh, the third and final thing that i want to discuss is the capacitor which you all know has the following symbol and uh, so the capacitance what it is is basically it's an so, so capacitance is an effect due to the polarization of a material which is essentially just the uh, creation of dipoles in response to an applied electric field so the higher the capacitance uh, the more the charge uh, the net charge that's stored on the capacitor um, and, uh, 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 and 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 the more polarization you have within uh, within within a dielectric, so for parallel plate capacitor, right, we have C is um, epsilon not uh, or epsilon A over D. We've all seen how epsilon is related to the polarization. Um, and the current flowing through the capacitor is related to the voltage across the capacitor as i is equal to c dv by dt right so once again uh, for a capacitor only circuit basically something like this where this is your voltage source v this is a switch s this is your capacitor c so for such a circuit um, if let's say uh, v is equal to some v naught e to the power iota omega t 
then um, I would become equal to uh, C V naught I omega um, e to the power of iota omega t right um, <clears throat> now which essentially is just i equals c v naught e to the iota omega t e to the i pi by 2 so once again once again v and i are 90 degrees out of phase but the difference is this time that the uh, in, in an inductor you had that current has a phase of minus pi by 2 in a capacitor current has a phase of plus pi by 2 so in this case the cu current leads voltage by 90 degrees okay um, in a capacitor and finally since we have been talking about voltages um, so we've been talking about electric potentials right when we say we apply a voltage we basically mean that we create an electric potential right and uh, if you just go back at the very start of the course we know that e is equal to negative the gradient of this potential v right so e of r is the gradient of v of r right um and that the integral from some point a to uh some point b of minus e dot dl is v of b minus v of e and um we basically take our reference point at infinity so when i say that we apply a voltage v where v is let's say v naught cosine omega t or whatever the voltage is so whenever we say that we apply a voltage what we basically mean is that v of r is the integral from infinity uh, to r of e dot dl right because we said that it doesn't matter what reference point you take and we take our reference point to be infinity with the way the electric potential is zero right so um so whenever we talk about potentials in a circuit right um this is where that comes from so uh with that with that knowledge uh we are now basically equipped to look at transmission line theory specifically for voltages and currents so the uh, symbol for a transmission line is something like this so you basically have one conductor and you have another conductor right so you always have two conductors so this is the symbol of a transmission line and so <clears throat> for us they'll basically be and, and more generally so you just have two pieces two parallel pieces of metal or wire right in practice they don't even have to be uh, have to be parallel and that's a transmission line right it's a type of waveguide it is a special type of wave guide so whenever we talk of a transmission line we'll basically talk about uh, this conductor and this conductor which are for our purposes parallel to each other okay um, so yani, I mean an ethernet cable is a transmission line um, uh, mains electricity you know the thing you see on the electricity pylons that they're, they're transmission lines and you always need two just remember that you always need, you, you always need two conductors uh, or even if you have one conductor then you have a reference which can be earth or something because you always need some reference right um, because uh, in order to let's say create 
a potential V on the top conducted here in order to create a potential V here that potential has to be a potential difference with regard to something so you need the second conductor so that the first conductor has some potential with regards to the second conductor and then these transmission lines can effectively transfer energy if both conductors are at the same potential then you're not basically uh, you know uh, transmitting anything essentially right um, uh, so that's uh, that's the point and what the potential is is just the integral from infinity to that point r of e dot dl right uh, basically that's what that is so uh, if that's okay then the way i would like to start is the more intuitive fashion uh, and we'll do the slightly less intuitive but easier uh, framework next time and so this thing what i want to do is that we want to do the time domain analysis of a transmission line right um, and transmission line is just two pieces of metal or conductors now um, <clears throat> so now here's the catch what you basically have are two pieces of metal uh, and there's some there's some potentials uh, with regards to one 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 another so most generally if we can argue that two pieces of metal can have attractive charges between them right and these attractive charges if let's say you have two conductors and you have a dielectric between them then these attractive charges basically lead to some capacitance right because if, if this is one conductor this is another conductor and let's say this is the dielectric material between them and if there are any uh, induced charges in this yellow region then, then that leads to some some capacitance uh, of this transmission line. So the transmission line can have capacitance. Similarly, uh, there can be some series resistance. I mean, your pieces of metal are not uh, perfect conductors, right? They'll have some finite resistance. So when when the signal travels, let's say, in one of the conductors then um, there will be some series resistance. Uh, the dielectric or whatever is separating the two conductors might not be uh, might not be a perfect dielectric. So you can have some shunt resistance. Right? So for example, uh, once again, if this is the first conductor and this is the second conductor, then uh, there can be a resistance between them and at the same time there can be a resistor on this line so you can have an a series resistance and you can have a shunt resistance right um, on a uh, uh, on a transmission line and similarly Moving on, so you can have capacitance, you can have series resistance, you can have shunt resistance, you can also have inductance. Right? Um, why can we have inductance? Because uh, we know that a current carrying wire uh, a current carrying wire um, produces a magnetic field right a current carrying wire produces a magnetic field um, 
and that magnetic field carries some energy right so uh, so in general since you have two conductors and there is probably a current in one of them uh, then uh, there is always some inductance right so there will be some inductance so a transmission line will have resistance it will have capacitance and it will have an inductance right but the the idea is that you can have let's say a 200 km transmission line from some power station to some grid station but in a uniform transmission line In a, in a uniform transmission line R, L and C are distributed evenly evenly uh, along the length right that's our assumption so we will model a very large transmission line as many many small segments joined together So, um, essentially what this is called is, uh, in more technical, this is called a distributed, because we've, bre we've broken up uh, a long transmission line into many, many small segments. So the approach we'll take is called a distributed lumped element model right um, and one of the conductors of course would be the ground yeah, or the earth so a segment of this transmission line a small segment a segment of length delta z is represented as follows so we basically have an input to the segment you have some inductance then between between the two conductors we have some capacitance then there will be some other inductance then there will be some other capacitance and then there'll be some other inductance and then some other capacitance between them and then you'll have the output ports of this small uh, of this small transmission line now for the purpose of this lecture because this is a, this is the first treatment uh, of the subject we will consider a lossless transmission line What does it mean that it's lossless? It basically means that there are no series or shunt resistances in our model. Right? So we're taking a perfect uniform lossless transmission line. So what we'll do is that we'll define capital L to be the inductance per unit length. So a small segment 
uh, delta z would have an would have an inductance l delta z and we will define the capacitance c to be the capacitance per unit length right um, and so then in terms of l and uh, uh, and c uh, if we join let's say three of these delta z segments then essentially we get something like where um so this is this is one delta z right so um this inductance would be so, so for example so this is one delta z this is another delta z, this is another delta z right so the inductance in this segment just this in this square the inductance would be um l delta z and here in this shunt segment the capacitance would be c delta z the capacitance is between the conductors because this is the the, the reason for this capacitance is uh, the creation of dipoles between these conductors right there's no capacitance along the uh, along these ideal conductors that we have uh, at the same point so over here once again we have an inductor of l delta z we have a capacitance of c delta z we once again have an inductor of l delta z and then we have a capacitor of c delta z right um now i just want to call these nodes i just want to label these nodes um so we'll call this node one we'll call this point node two and we'll call this point node three okay um we'll call the current over here we'll call it i we'll call the current after node 2 i plus delta i and we'll call the current after node 3 as i plus 2 delta i and similarly we'll call the voltage at node 1 we'll call it v we'll call the voltage at node 2 as v plus delta v and we'll call the voltage at node 3 as v plus 2 delta v okay um, and z is increasing in that direction now um, i just want to uh, I, I, I just want to make revise Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. Right. So Kirchhoff's voltage law, uh, it essentially follows from uh, uh, it follows from uh, from f from del cross E is equal to minus partial B by partial T, uh, which is just that if you don't have a time varying magnetic field, uh, external magnetic field uh, applied to any loop, then um, the sum of voltages the sum of voltages uh, around a closed loop. with no time varying external magnetic field this is excluding the, the voltages we are counting over so um, so the sum of voltages around a closed loop um, is zero 
right and similarly for Kirchhoff's current law uh, this is essentially just the conservation of charge it follows from the continuity equation which is that uh, the total current um, entering and leaving a conductive junction sums to zero so if this is a, a junction and this is wire coming into the junction let's say current i1 flows into the junction and i3 and i2 flow out of the junction then Kirchhoff's current law sim simply says that i1 is equal to i2 plus i3 right and this is just a statement of the conservation of charge and this follows from the continuity equation if this was not true then you would have a continuous build up of uh, uh, of voltage um, uh, at this point right so let's now apply uh, kvl which is Kirchhoff's voltage law and kcl which is Kirchhoff's current law at different nodes on this transmission line so um, <clears throat> the voltage at node 1 so the voltage at node 1 that's v and the voltage at node 2 is v plus delta v right so um now between v and v plus delta v uh, we have one inductor right so uh, v minus v plus delta v uh, which is equal to minus uh, delta v of course this must be equal to l delta z uh, times uh, partial i by partial t right so uh, delta v delta v which is the dif which is the difference between the voltage and at node 1 and node 2 must be equal to um, minus l delta z partial i by partial t um, similarly so now we've done the voltage analysis let's do the current analysis now the current through the capacitor at node 2 uh, is minus delta i right because um, well, well because uh, the current afterwards is uh, i plus delta i going out of the going out of node 2 so uh, then that means that minus i must be going out so that minus minus plus and so you have i plus delta i going out of node 2 right you can uh, you can see the signs uh, if you go back to the previous slide so the current uh, going through the capacitor is minus delta i and minus delta i must be equal to c delta z times partial by partial t of v plus delta v because that's the voltage at node 2 um, now this then just uh, if you if you open the bracket this becomes equal to uh, c delta z times partial delta v by partial t plus c delta z uh, partial v by partial t now you see uh, to a first order approximation we'll take this term to be equal to zero because delta z and delta v are both small so their product is even smaller so in our first order approximation so minus uh, delta i is approximately equal to uh, c delta z uh, partial v by partial t Right, so where C delta Z is the incremental capacitance between the piece of metal and the ground plane. Yeah, where the second wire is the ground plane, right? Now, um, now take the limit uh, 
that delta z uh, goes to zero, right? Now, in the limit that delta z goes to zero, what you basically get is that so the limit as delta z goes to zero minus delta i or by delta z becomes equal to partial i of z t by partial z which is equal to c delta v of z t by partial t right this is just what we derived in, our, uh, in the previous slide so um, our first equation of importance becomes that partial i of z t by partial z becomes equal to c uh, so I, I, I missed a minus sign so minus c uh, partial v of z t by partial t right so and we will call this equation a now similarly <clears throat> Using the other equation we had, the limit as um, delta z goes to zero of uh, delta v over delta z becomes equal to partial v by partial z, which is equal to minus l partial i by partial t. So uh, what this reduces to is just that uh, partial v of z t by partial z is equal to minus l partial i of z t by partial t right uh, and this is our second equation of importance for lossless transmission lines and this is equation B. Uh, now what we have here uh, equation A and equation B here so equation A and equation B are called the telegrapher equations for lossless transmission lines. Now we've seen telegraph, uh, telegraph uh, equations before uh, when we were doing, uh, 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 when we basically constructed our wave equations, uh, but these are also called telegraph equations for, tra uh, for lossless transmission lines. Uh, there's a more general form of the of the telegraphic equation for transmission lines in terms of resistances also But since we've ignored resistances for now, so these are obviously uh, lossless uh, lossless equations What these are so these are two Coupled because the voltage is coupled to the current so these are two coupled first order uh, Differential equations Right, and uh, we can decouple them and uh, when we decouple them we get two second order differential equations And so, uh, if you if you let's say if if you take the partial derivative of each with t, and then you uh, substitute, uh, basically what you'll find is that del two v by del z squared becomes equal to l c partial two v by partial t squared and the second equation for
or I will become um, <clears throat> uh, del 2 partial to I by partial z squared would be lc del 2 i by del t squared and it's remarkable because these look very similar to the wave equations we used to have um, in terms of um, electric fields and v fields so these are also wave equations so you will call this equation c and we call this equation d and what these are these are basically, uh, these are wave equations. For um, voltage and current in a lossless transmission line okay and we've seen equations of this form before for example we used to have the del square e was mu naught epsilon naught del 2 e by del t square uh, in vacuum and mu naught epsilon then uh, 1 over the square root of that then became the velocity of our wave right so by similar logic um, you, you can probably uh, appreciate that uh, when, when, whenever we solve these uh, differential equations then whatever wave wave solutions that we get, the uh, velocity of the wave the phase velocity would probably be given as well it's definitely given as one over the square root of L C. Right? Um and uh, and this is an, an, an exact analogy to 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 the speed of light of one over square root of mu naught epsilon naught we used to get when we used to have a factor of uh, mu naught epsilon naught here and this used to be e and this used to be e yeah we bate this used to be b this used sorry this used to be um, this was b this was b and this was mu naught epsilon naught right so tabi uh, speed of light one over square root of mu naught epsilon naught aati thi. So by same logic, yeah, my pass is jo jo bhi inke solution donge, unki velocity one over square root of lc aegi. Acha. Now if that's all right. Then um, let's consider. So let's consider <coughs> a forward propagating uh, voltage. Um, so let's 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 consider a forward propagating voltage solution actually. Okay, instead of a such solution, which is positive z, which travel kar hai. and let's call it v of z t. Okay, I'll do this in more familiar notation next time. But everything we do here is also correct and more general actually. So some forward propagating wave v of z t. Let's call it f plus, which is in positive direction. Me ja rahi hai, of z minus vt okay so it's varying in position and it's also varying in time and uh, as z increases so um, i mean uh, as t increases the wave moves to the right Achha. now um and an example of this an example of such a wave could be for example uh, v of zt is some v naught e to the i of kz minus omega t theke, which you can write as some v naught e to the i k times z minus v t right so we will basically take uh, this form of um, this form of solution and we'll substitute this in these wave equations here um, so now the first thing we'll do is we'll consider some is that we will substitute this voltage into equation B. The equation B we had two slides before. So substitute V into equation B. Right? When we do that, what we see is that minus L partial I by uh, partial T becomes equal to 
partial v by partial z which is uh, a derivative of f plus of z minus vt right so uh, then minus l di by dt is f prime plus of z minus vt fine now similarly if you substitute v into equation a and what you basically get is that uh, partial i by partial z becomes equal to minus c partial v by partial t so that becomes equal to uh, this time of course the velocity comes out when we take the derivative so this becomes equal to c times the velocity times f plus prime of z minus vt right so now we have two equations so um so partial i by partial z becomes equal to c v f plus prime of z minus vt okay and at the same time partial i by partial z becomes equal to minus 1 over l times f prime plus of z minus vt okay where this equation is just uh, this equation rearranged okay now uh, if you look at both of these equations okay uh, what you basically conclude is that if you integrate either one uh, with respect to i so you, you either integrate with respect, to, with respect to z or or you integrate with respect to uh, uh, with respect to um, uh, t so what you basically get is that i becomes equal to 1 over v l f plus of z minus v t which is just the square root of c over l f plus of z minus v t but you see something very special has happened here and uh, I'll point it out in a second so this is i is just under root c over l f plus of z minus vt this is just some forward propagating wave so now now we have an expression of for v of zt and we also have i as a function of z and t now the impedance so the double images would probably be very familiar with the impedance but the physics image is that so so we define something define impedance as a quantity z take okay. define z uh, which is v v of zt over i of zt and if you divide the expression of v by the expression of i um actually let me just be a bit more clear this is c over l right so then uh z becomes equal to the uh, square root of l over c right and this is actually in fact this is called z naught and this is called the characteristic impedance right so a lossless waveguide a lossless waveguide of this type where you have two conductors one is grounded and the other uh, is just a conductor carrying your signal has a characteristic impedance of z naught which is equal to square root of l over c this is a very very significant uh, result and it has this impedance for a 
right traveling wave um, now if you repeat this calculation if you find v of z t over i of z t for uh, for a left traveling wave basically that would be um, an f minus of z plus vt you will find that z naught becomes equal to minus square root of l over c for left traveling okay now uh, why is impedance important uh, I'll require a couple of lectures to actually motivate this properly but for now all I can say is that uh, impedance has a similar role to, uh, in some sense, it has a similar role to refractive index for electromagnetic waves. And what that basically means is that impedance becomes important when we interface transmission lines with a load or a source or another transmission line. And there is this term which is called impedance matching And the idea basically is that if you have, if you have, let's say, a transmission line, take a, if you have a transmission line, and this transmission line is connected to some load, then if you match the impedance of the load with the impedance of the transmission line, then uh, you can basically maximize power transfer. Yeah, similarly, if you have, let's say, uh, if in the same figure, you also have some source, then if you match the output impedance of your source with the impedance of your transmission line, and if that is matched with the impedance of your load, then uh, you get lossless transfer. Uh, I, I, and basically you don't get any reflections uh, from the other side. Um, and so that's where, where impedance matching becomes important. The reason I say this is tied to refractive index is because if you go back to your Fresnel equations, for example, if you look at, let's say, uh, the incidence of an electromagnetic wave at normal incidence on a dielectric interface, then if the, if the refractive index of, of the two dielectrics are the same, you get no reflections. Similarly, if the if the impedance of two uh, transmission lines is the same when you connect them, there's no reflection. Um, but of course, I'll uh, I'll rigorously prove this uh, in the next couple of lectures. Take it, and this will basically become the crux of our transmission line theory. So for now, impedance is the ratio of the voltage to, to the current. Uh, uh, we'll we'll talk about Fourier transforms a, uh, a bit in the next in 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 the coming lectures. Uh, which are to define impedance more rigorously, but for a lossless line, I'm happy if at least you understand that the impedance, which is which is the ratio of the uh, voltage to the current, is a function of space and time at f is square root of L over C. Okay, this is the impedance of uh, of the transmission line. This is the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Take at every point, sort of. Uh, so if that's clear, the next time we'll basically take uh, take our uh, our treatment of transmission lines a bit further. 
um, we'll apply frequency domain analysis also um, and then we'll go to impedance matching uh, and some special cases of waveguides right uh, thank you very much and i will see you in uh, in lecture uh, 24 thank you